Welcome, everyone, to another episode of uh, Character Development and Leadership Podcast for the Greco Roman National Team. And uh, we've got a we got a really special guest today. Aaron Steed is joining me and Rick. And uh, Aaron is the founder of Meathead Moving. He founded this company when he was in high school. He was a he was a wrestler in high school and a college wrestler at Cal Poly. And uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron and tell us like how this how this idea happened and. I know that him and his brother were wrestling in high school and decided to start a company. Yeah. Well, first off, thank you, Coach Lindland, for having me uh, be on. It's a huge honor. And, um, yeah, long story short, you know, we just needed to figure out a way to make money while going to school and playing sports. Parents didn't give us much money, so we had to just figure it out. Um, I was super uh, focused on wrestling, trying to advance my career, had really big goals that I – did not achieve, <laughs> but in order, but in trying to achieve my goals, I realized I needed to figure out a way to, 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 uh, to make some funds and make the ends meet. So, uh, I went to my friend's parents, uh, on the wrestling and football team and said, look, Hey, if you ever need anything done around the house, um, let us know, I'll come and do it. Pay me whatever you think I'm worth. And, um, and we'll just go from there. So it's pretty hard to say no to that. And then, uh, and then a lot of people just wanted us to help move because moving is miserable and expensive. And the deal was they'd rent the truck. And then me and my brother and our friends, we'd go in and do the moving and the customers would pay us whatever they thought we were worth. Okay. So this was, you were a junior, senior in high school? What? Yeah, I was a junior in high school at the time. Okay. Yeah. And then and then you started this company and how long did it take where, where you were like, Man, I got a, I, I got a business. I got to incorporate. I got to figure out how to do. All, I mean, you're a kid. You're a high school kid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, you, you started an actual corporation of some sort, LLC, a, a what? Like, tell us. No, it was just an unorganized, under the table student labor service. You know, uh, wasn't trying to complicate <laughs> it much. We were just trying to make our ends meet and have a couple bucks in our wallet. You know, uh, and then what happened? Our, our third, fourth year in business, we started getting so popular, um, people around town started talking about, hey, there's this group of ambitious, athletic guys that will do work for you, and you pay them whatever you think they're worth, and we developed a reputation for being trustworthy and caring and on time and keeping our commitments, and uh, our competitors teamed up against us, and uh, we ended up having our phone lines turned off. Uh, by the state of California because we were uh, got in trouble for operating without a license. Um, <laughs> you know, so it was like right before summer, right before like me and like 30 of my good friends and my brother were w looking to, to make a lot of money that we could save for the rest of the year. And it took about five minutes and, you know, we felt like it was an act of war. Like how dare you try to, uh, turn off our phone and put us out of business when the only reason why we're popular is because all you other moving companies do a terrible job, break people's things. No one trusts or likes typical movers. You know, we're coming in and like providing a great service and a great value and told over and over again, how good of a job we did. So that's when we decided, Hey, we're going to get the license. We're going to get the permit and we're going to organize this idea of student athlete movers and uh, try to stomp out our competition. So you, instead of gear hunting better, they just tried to cut you out. Totally. Yeah. They, there, there was no discussion. Just all of a sudden our phone line was turned off and this is before the internet. So you went, this was like, this was like, uh, 1999, you know, 2000, uh, and, and you went to the phone book to call a phone number. That phone number was disconnected because uh, we didn't have attorneys lobbying the state of California uh, for to turn off our, our phone, you know, we, we couldn't fight against it. So that's when we're like, all right, we got to get legal and beat these guys at, at their own game, apply that wrestling mindset to business, and let's see what we can do. Okay, okay so th by this time you're in college yet or you're still in high school? Mm -hmm. No, I was in college and my brother had just graduated high school. So what college are you okay. in? Okay, okay. I was at, yeah, I was at Cuesta and then I took a few classes, uh, at Cal Poly and then ended up dropping out. 
So you basically ask, what is it? Beg forgiveness, not ask for permission. You just came up with this business idea to basically see a way that you could help others, came up with some initiative, had some ingenuity about it and did the miserable things other people wouldn't do, kicked ass yeah. at it. And then they tried to cut you out and you still stepped around in the throne for five. There's no, there's no other way, you know, because I truly felt like we were helping save our customers from having bad moving experiences from the typical moving companies. Typical moving companies do a terrible job. They hire just like, you know, um, individuals like you wouldn't want a room in, in a room alone with your mother. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and then not only were we doing a good job for our customers, but uh, we're providing jobs for fellow student athletes uh, like myself, like my brother who needed work. Uh, these are, you know, these are people who need to make ends meet. And I took a lot of pride in being able to do that for my friends and to, uh, and I just remember like having the phone lines turned off and uh, being served with that legal paperwork. Uh, I, I, it, I took it very personal as an act of war and it was, uh, it was a complete reshift in my priorities almost immediately. It was part of what made me want to drop out of college so we can focus full time on this moving business and, um, and uh, expand what we're doing because we found a lot of purpose and passion for it. Even though it's just moving furniture, really we're providing the best job to the student athlete and we're providing the uh, uh, most trustworthy moving service to our clients. And as a young man, it was hard to find a way to get to create value for others. It was hard for me to find a way to get um, uh, to do things that really were like meaningful for other people. I, I wrestled and that was meaningful for me, but I didn't really create value for anyone else until I started doing this. And that's what made it like intoxicating and addicting. Was, was the idea of, of serving others was, is what you yeah. fell in love with really was serving your employees, which were, you know, student athletes that are pursuing another goal. And then yeah. also just, providing the best quality service your client and develop you don't just develop these i mean you don't just send these guys out there you train them and you develop yeah. them you have university of moving and mm -hmm. like tell us about you know what what that looks like what's the what's the onboarding process you got you got a student athlete so back then it was just your boys like yeah you know one of your wrestlers football player you yeah. know but now but now the business is is growing yes. How does a guy get to where, Hey, I want to, I want to have part-time work. I want to supplement my income in between training. How does, how does that process happen? Yeah. So, you know, one of our uh, values here, people value what they earn. So it, we make it hard to make the meathead squad, uh, not to, not, not, not to uh, be over cumbersome, but the harder someone works at something, the more they're going to value it. Um, so there's the multiple step interview process, which, uh, Absolutely. requires, you know, role playing customer service situations. They need to pass background check. There's drug screening, um, a DMV check. And then, uh, once they get hired, they're paid to observe two moving jobs where they're not moving. They're just taking notes. And then we have a military inspired training program with over 400 moving procedures that, uh, they need to get signed off on by their supervisors vouching for their competency on different tasks and that they need to perform like how to secure an appliance dolly and different things that they need to know like how to introduce yourself to a customer or uh, what proper moving terminology is uh, so even though they're temporary student athlete laborers there's a professional training background and we are leveraging the tried and true system that the armed forces has put in place to put our young men and women uh to put our you know men and women uh so they can help like understand and comprehend uh uh everything that we've learned over the years and we've made tons of mistakes over the years we've like almost anything you could imagine you know We've done it. We, we average 15,000 moves a year. So whenever we make a mistake that's costly or whenever we do something that's really awesome that we want to replicate, uh, we're pretty good at uh, 
proceduralizing it and then spreading that knowledge amongst our workforce. And I think that's been a key part as to why we've been able to grow and scale like we have. So what, what, I, what I'm hearing is not only are you, you bringing these guys in, you're giving them professional development skills that they're going to yep. need past moving. Maybe, maybe somebody's, their goal is to, to take on another career when they're done with college sports, yep. but you're, you're building those skills into them, how to, how to work with customers, how to do sales even possibly, or yeah. uh, different types of stuff like that. Yeah. You know, everyone starts off as a mover and then they can go on and they could uh, become uh, a manager uh, as a mover. And then they could also go on when we hire someone, we, we say, Hey, we don't want any career movers working here. You have two choices, either help us grow, open up other offices and you could either go the sales or the operations path. And we have a whole self-administered training program to where you can start as a mover and then end as an operations manager or a sales manager and where there's, you know, 10 different promotional opportunities in between or pick your own successful career goal path. Do you want to, like, for example, do you want to be a firefighter? Uh, do you want to open up a gym? Uh, do you want to open up a restaurant? Do you want to be a dentist? Whatever it is, we get clear and identify what their goals are. You know, the vast majority of our employees want, to do something outside of meathead movers, which is fine. We'll happily employ them until they go on to the next phase uh, in their life. But we don't want a career mover working here. We want people who have bigger goals and aspirations. And one thing that's really neat about moving that I didn't realize when we first started is that so many of the experiences that they gain here uh, doing moving can help them with their future self. So, uh, like if I put on the, my job resume that I worked at Meathead Movers for two years and then I moved away to Colorado Springs and said, hey, I worked at Meathead Movers, an employer would look at that and say, who cares? So what? It's a moving company with a funny name. But if I were to say, hey, I got promoted five times for the largest independent moving company in California. And during that, I successfully led 300 men, and uh, I was responsible for transporting $5 million worth of cargo, and I have a customer view score of 99.5% from all of my customers, and boom, here all, here's all my customer feedback survey. That's going to leave a much different impression, and we arm our employees with that information when they're job hunting. And we're the only company that I'm aware of that will actually call the hiring manager of the job that our employees are trying to get while they're still employed with us. It's called encouraged turnover. So if we have an employee that wants to become a firefighter and assuming this employee is doing great, we'll call the fire chief and say, look, this guy's working for us. He does a great job and we highly recommend that you hire him. And what that does is it has our it, it helps our employees view us as a stepping stone job. So and they're going to tell their friends like, hey, this job is going to help you get to the next phase. And um, and it's hard, you know, as a businessman to lose good employees. But I'd rather be a company that stands for something that is serving them and doing more than just like trying to bilk as much moving out of them. And I think long term will be served better. Um, hey, can I get a job? That's awesome. I, I don't <laughs> That's, think... People got to love that. I don't think we can afford an astronaut salary. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> uh, that's You're incredible. You're overqualified. Yeah. You're over well, Rick, Rick just, he just likes the idea of staying in shape while he's working. He's getting paid, getting paid to stay in shape. And that, I mean, that's another benefit for your the guys that are at places. I mean, I remember when, when I was going to junior college, cause I wasn't, you know, we're coming out of high school. I wasn't a good enough wrestler to get recruited by any, you know, big time school. So I wow. went to uh Clackamas community college, the, you know, back to back national champs right now. Uh, Coach Roden is just killing it. And that's another guy. We definitely let's, let's mark that down. Cause this guy is doing amazing stuff out there, but 
he wasn't the coach when, when I was there. Um, he's a, he's a lot younger man than me cause I'm 50 now. Uh, just, just had my birthday this week, but you know, I look for jobs like one. So I would go to school in the, the fall and I go to school in the winter, but I would take the spring and summer off to pay for school and to allow me to wrestle. And I, I worked in a sawmill because I was moving lumber all day. And then, uh, the next summer I packed Todd for bricklayers and, uh, and all these things I was just looking at, Oh, how can I use these as training modalities? Yeah. And, and one of the cool things you, you have your guys do, and I think there's, there's so much benefit to, to seeing this. There's this company. I love them. They're called Les Schwab tires. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Oh yeah. But sure. if you, if you pull up to the store, somebody's running to your car and and yeah. opening they're trying to open the door before you can get out you know and greet you um but you're at you're you're athletes your athletes your employees because you treat these guys like athletes because yeah. you manage like a coach we're going to get into that yeah. but they run they run and they hustle and they tell us about that and tell us about that philosophy yeah no at meathead you're required to run when not carrying anything so uh, get paid to work out. Perfect job for the student athlete. Move heavy things, run to get more. And it uh, also, since we, along with other moving companies, charge on an hourly rate, it saves the clients money. And it's also a point of pride because, you know, a lot of people are not physically capable of moving that hard. So to be able to work uh, as an, at, at Meathead Movers, it, uh, it's a point of pride because it, it, it's not something that all people can do, like wrestling. Like wrestling. That's, that's awesome, man. So yeah. like you, what strikes me is you're investing in the person and that's got to be huge for the, well, person, right? So, I mean, you got young guys, student athletes looking to make their way in the world and just having an opportunity to work is special, but then having an opportunity to work for a place that invests in you as a person, not just in, in, invest in you as an employee to climb their own chain, but where you said you'll actually reach out and help found them other opportunities if that's what they want. Yeah. I mean, is that something that you guys started with or is, are, are those kind of policies and procedures that developed over time that you kind of thought, like how did that whole yeah. mindset come that's about it. in your business management? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Rick. Uh, about 10 years ago. So from the time we started, we always had the best athletes working for us and things were going great. And, uh, you, you know, the, the team captains of most of the sports teams, uh, Division One, Junior College, you know, they, were, they, they all wanted to work at Meathead. And then what happened is as I got older and found myself married with a cat, you know, stuff like that, I became less relatable. And, and it wasn't just about me, but it was, it was just the culture had changed. And people started viewing Meathead as just a regular job where they were like, oh, should I go work at Meathead or should I go work construction or should I go be a bartender or, some, or something of that nature? And what scared the heck out of me is I realized if we don't have the just the most athletic determined people working for us in the community, then we're going to lose our edge. I started thinking like I have to evolve and grow and change our value proposition to our employees. Um, so that's when we decided to get real clear with our employees as far as what are their goals five to 10 years from now? What do they, where do they see themselves? And it's either gonna be with Team Meathead, they're gonna help us open up other offices or they're gonna start their own successful career doing something else. And then our job is to help connect the dots as far as what sort of work experiences at Meathead is going to help their future self. So then we had a deep discussion as far as how can working at a company like Meathead Movers help someone become successful in the future. Now, it just so happens that working at Meathead, that within a year's time, you can manage, you can get promoted, become a manager and manage dozens of employees. And there's all kinds of studies to show that a manager's income trajectory is 35 to 40 percent more than someone who isn't a manager or a leader so immediately boom out of from this job an entry-level job they're a management role trajectory two 
what six figure job are you not having to solve problems in high stress situations? Moving, you're constantly solving problems in high stress situations. Uh, explaining and executing legal contracts. You know, our contract is like 10 pages long for our customers to sign and having to explain it and go over it with legal liability and charges and uh, valuation. And I mean, start, stop times, like all kinds of stuff. There's a lot to it. Becoming mentally and physically stronger. Uh, the opportunity to drive and get trained on commercial uh, to drive commercial vehicles, uh, learning our award-winning customer service program, uh, developing lifelong friendships and future business partnerships. Like there's so many uh, skills and so many resources that they can take working at Meathead to help their future self. So our job became less about, hey, uh, our job became more about um, helping our employees identify their goals and helping them connect the dots on how the work experiences they get at Meathead is going to help them get those goals and is going to help them communicate to the person who is the next hiring manager or banker uh, as to why they're qualified to level up in their life. And it feels really good. Think of the, to kind of get in the weeds of the granularities of that. That's really, it's really cool and impressive that you did that. And I wanted to ask then, it seems like you built the culture in the company. And then, like you said, you kind of aged into a different phase in your life where you had a cat and a wife and <laughs> a life and all that. Right. And so yeah. you built the culture and then the culture kind of started slowly morphing into whatever it had become. And then you had to change this, your own culture there a second or third time then. Yeah. And my question okay. then uh, to kind of, follow on that at a granularity level is how did you do that was it something where because because if the culture is now different and you're trying to make it change from that did you do was that an overnight thing where you brought everyone in and said hey this is hey we need we need a recheck these are the new rules and policies or was it a gradual thing like because you have guys that then would have to change and adjust to that and how i'm curious how that process yeah. went how'd you navigate yeah. it yeah, no, that's a great question. So uh, I have a leadership coach. His name is Jeremiah Miller. He was a California high school state champion. Uh, he was a, a starter at Cal Poly Wrestling for four years. Anyways, uh, he owns a company called Forging Leaders. And uh, one of the tenants that he has taught me is the importance of clarity, strategy, and accountability as a leader. You, as, so long as you're providing clarity, strategy, and accountability for your team, you are working within the quadrants of leadership. Meathead 2.0, and which is this rethinking of the value that we're providing to our uh, employees. And my brother and I spent two weeks, we rescheduled everything we have going on. We spent two weeks uh, at the computer and we rethought uh, the, uh, the recruiting process, the hiring process, the training process, and the ongoing a relationship with our employees, including creating a hall of fame or after meathead, uh, the entire life cycle of an employee, we rethought it and we put a, and we put a structure behind it. Um, and at the end of the day, like starting with the end in mind, our goal is to be the ultimate stepping stone job for the student athlete. So how do we do that? We do that by getting clear on what their goals are. So every six months, when we hire them and every six months after that, what is we have a form, five, ten years out, what is your goal? Are you with Team Meathead or, or your own goal? How is this job going to help you do that? And then your goal and how this job is going to help you do that becomes your personal goal statement. And that's how we know our employees. That's how we keep in touch with them. So for example, and it goes down to everything, even coaching. So if one of our employees comes to us, man, I had a really bad day. I was working with so-and-so. He's lazy. He sucks. He took 30 bathroom breaks, whatever. We can say, well, hey, you want to open up your own business one day, right, Kevin? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you think you'll ever have an employee isn't performing well? Well, yeah, probably. Hey, this is an opportunity for you to practice right now you know or i have the customers the customer is so mean she calls me all these terrible names 
well, yeah, you want to have your own business one day, right? Right. Okay. Well, do you think you, you, you see what I'm saying? It's like, but knowing and understanding what people want and then reverse engineering, like how you are trying to achieve your goals by them achieving their goals, put us in a way better place and being able to get way better performance from our uh, employees. And it made our operations management staff more like coaches and less like moving operators. And let's face it, moving sucks. So if you can find a way to create more value and be able to serve your employees and understand what makes them tick, it's freaking cool. Moving sucks. That's why the hell are you? And totally. <laughs> no, I mean, we, I said we are going to get back to this. And it sounds like you're, you're not a boss. You're a coach. I mean, everything you're talking about is what this show is about. It's about developing leaders. And what I'm hearing from you that you deliberately intended to go out and change the business to develop leaders and to coach yeah. these these young men and women into becoming you know successful individuals outside of business and within business as well. And so, yeah, tell us a little more about the and, and you get coached yourself. So, as as the the head coach of Meathead Movers, you have a coach. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think being finding a coach that you that you respect uh, is really important. Having the humility to be coached is really important. And it starts with what your goals are. And then how do you want to go about I have business goals. And I think I'm gonna have a higher probability of achieving those business goals if I'm being coached correctly. Same thing when I was competing in wrestling, I had wrestling goals. And I know that I need to get coached by someone who knows more about wrestling than me in order to achieve it. It's the same thing. How people, why, why people wouldn't want to get coached doesn't make any sense to me. I, I love being coached. I, I was, you know, I spent, you know, since this whole uh, pandemic, you know, started, I've been out in Oregon and I only had one day where I went up to the Valley and I, I went kayaking, but who did I call to go kayaking with was, was my kayak coach. And was awesome. like, Hey, can we get out? And, you know, and that was, that was a big thing. When I, when I switched from wrestling to MMA, I got coaches, you know, yeah. we, we share a similar coach. Uh, John Hackleman was one of my yeah. coaches and I know yeah. you trained at the pit and, and still yeah. do, or you're still doing, you're doing jujitsu. I know that, but yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing jujitsu. Yeah. You know, but it's finding that coach that you trust, you connect yeah. with, you believe in, um, in, and he's here to grow you as a, as an individual, whether it's in the in the sporting field that you've chosen, or if it's as a human. And I mean, yeah. you've taken those lessons and just really plugged those into the business. I mean, that's such a cool uh, way to run a company, Aaron. Thank you. I, I I appreciate that, and that means the world to me coming from you. Um, and if and I mean, if you're willing to allow yourself to be coached. And why wouldn't anyone allow themselves to be coached? It's all about getting better, right? Like every day. And, um, and I think you got to ask yourself, what, what do you have a lot of energy for? Like you clearly have a lot of energy for doing extreme kayaking, you know, and I have a lot of energy for business and how uh, in jujitsu and, and, you know, and, and I know there's lots, lots of other interests and, and, and if you can find a way where you can expend a lot of energy, find your power source, whatever you want to call it, and then uh, work with someone who can help you achieve it, it's pretty magical. Like it's, it, it's, it's one of the most rewarding things uh, I think people can, can, can go through, you know, and um, I'm not interested at all in running a moving company. And just looking at my business as moving boxes and furniture from one place to the next and looking at it in such a linear way. Uh, what gets me going is the personal development, understanding what are, who our people are, where they're trying to go, and how am I going to help get them there. Moving furniture is just the vehicle which uh, facilitates enough value creation for our clients to do it. It's that simple. You know... That's actually, it's funny you mentioned that. It's how I've always approached neuroscience and, and the work we do in academia. Um, there's yeah. times I've talked to people where I've said, you know, it's kind of, you know, because like you said, in all jobs, every job has a part that sucks. That's that's why it's not called vacation. 
you know? <laughs> and yeah. so it's like, there's parts that we don't like. And I talk to students all the time and about, I said, well, there's things I want to do in life that aren't involved in this. They're different goals, but you know, I could probably do some other things. And I, and I drew upon my, some of my blue collar buddies that I would work with, you know, uh, framers, painters, um, what have you. And it's like, I looked at neuroscience or, or academia as that nine to five, <clears throat> this is the vehicle that, that I can use to reach people, to help students develop in their lives, to coach them in, in mentor and have that access to influence people um, just happen to be that vehicle. Um, and, and, you know, like nobody wakes up and says, Hey mom, dad, I want to grow up and work with a bunch of spreadsheets. And, you know, like that's, that's not so much fun about what we do, but it does give us that vehicle to do that. And that's, that's awesome that you can see that approach, uh, applied in that. Um, you mentioned something about what kind of person wouldn't like that ability to be coached, to improve, to get better. And one of the things that actually we we're finding in neuroscience and psychology is there are at least certainly two kinds of people. And, and there's a phenomenon called the Dunning Kruger effect, where uh, basically if you ask people to estimate how good they are compared to a group, some people overestimate and say, I'm way better than the group and other people underestimate and say, I don't know, I'm probably a little bit below average. Um, those people, those groups are wrong. The overestimators or the people who say that they're better tend to actually be the worst in the group. And the people who say, I don't know, I'm kind of, you know, waffling, they tend to actually be the best. And hmm. we actually just completed a study about that in our lab. It's just resubmitted it for publication. It should come out soon. We got brain activity measures of what's different in the brains of people who basically don't want to be coached because they think they're fine. They're already above everything. And it's a fundamentally different pattern of brain activity while they're doing the task, while they're making those judgments about themselves, using the same kind of self-awareness that you just eloquently described having, uh, as well as the value and benefit of having it, how much you guys have grown and succeeded because of it. And there's like basically the people who don't want to be coached, the people who think like, no, I, I'm already way above everybody. They have this like frontal cortex pattern of activity that in the field we know is associated with things just seeming fluent and familiar and basically using intuition to just kind of like use their gut to make some judgments. And the people who are exhibiting what you described of this positive self-awareness and self-reflection and metacognition about wanting to grow seeing your areas that you might want to grow from and grow to that was associated with a pattern of activity in the, and basically the left parietal cortex, which is kind of like back here, uh, it was fundamentally different. And so there are those different things. And I think what we got to figure out is how do we get people from that starting point to where you're at? A little bit, Rick, is it a little bit like the, the, the fixed versus growth mindset? I mean, I'm more lame and I'm not an this, So, but but I understand guys that that don't want to be coached are the guys that are like I'm they have that fixed mindset like I'm an athlete I can you know like, they don't believe they can get better by setting goals and working towards those goals and and putting time energy and effort into this and then the guys with the growth mindset are always looking to get better so is is there some kind of correlation between those two things that you're talking about? I would imagine so. We didn't we didn't have a variable for that in this exact experiment that we ran. No one had ever actually ran an experiment like this before with physiology. So we had to innovate and kind of invent a way to do it. So we had to keep it simple. And so we couldn't have like a separate sort of psychological inventory of, of those kind of mindsets. But if I was in Vegas, I would put a bet on the table saying that they presumably would certainly overlap with a lot of parallels that fixed versus my mind, or excuse me, fixed versus growth mindset definitely tracks a lot of what we're seeing in that regard. And they did correlate between the behavior and the neurophysiology of the brain waves as well, uh, between those judgments and the actual performance. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, hopefully it should come out soon. We got some good reviews from it and it tracks exactly what you were saying. So, I mean, I, I was just inspired by everything you're discussing, Aaron, because I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. And it's like, you get to be a coach and you don't have to follow any NCA rules. That's awesome. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah.
That's that's a fascinating study uh, that you're bringing into light. That's really really interesting stuff. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. It was a, a team of students did a great job in it. We had some graduate students, uh, a lot of Mueller, Lindsay, Sirianni, and a whole team of assistants who, who really led that for a couple of years here. And they're now in better graduate schools now and, and doing great stuff. So, um, you know, it was a good, it was a good team effort. Um, but that's, like you said, you got to love that. I think there's that kind of person who loves being the dumbest person in the room because that means you're surrounded by people who are making you better. And it's like, you just crave having people to, to sharpen that steel with. Right. And, you know, the, and I think there's a different kind of people that loves being the champion on, in the JV tournament and loves beating up on everybody and feeling great. But like, right. why, like you said, why, who wouldn't want to do that? But because you have that growth mindset, like, yeah, you, you probably aren't even associated with a lot of people who, who would expose you to that alternative mindset that is actually kind of common, unfortunately, to people. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't surround yourself with those type of people, I guess. <laughs> who no. would do that? I, I don't who? know. From the, I, and, I, I know and, and I know that's one thing all three of us have in common, you know, it's, it, it's, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So like, yeah. I, so it's some well, of those, mindsets you mentioned that you took a wrestling mindset right when the business was starting when they started cutting off your phones and you're like yo this seems more and yes. what do you remember i guess it was long ago enough maybe you don't remember the details but is there anything that pops in mind of what the wrestling mindset was that you applied to business when it became war and how you won that war like is there anything that came to mind where you're like it felt like a match or like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up shot X or like, is there anything that like stands out where like looking back at like teenage Aaron, you're like, yo, it's go time, man. Yeah. Well, like, you know, before a dual meet, uh, the team captain will have kind of like a war chant with the guys and like pump them up and, you know, do a break or, or something like that, like a pep talk. Uh, I remember us doing that, you know, uh, before dispatch every single day, you know, that was, that was, uh, that was one of the, that was one of the things that we did. And then, um, another thing we did just to go ahead and get scrappy is I'd be willing to do the things no other moving company would be willing to do. Just like in wrestling, if you're going to get up in the morning before school and run or, you know, do the grip workout, like during class, like, uh, do technique after practice, you know, uh, all the things that other people aren't willing to do. If you're willing to do it, you're going to step onto the mat. You're going to believe that you deserve to win. And you're going to believe that you deserve to lead. And uh, things that we would do uh, back in the day is we would literally I, at Staples for nine ninety nine, we could get a thousand business cards and we'd go to our local farmer's market, which is our biggest community gathering. And uh, we'd meet at one side of the one end of farmer's market. I give everyone a big stack of business cards. And then one person uh, would say meathead, scream it. And then 20 of us would just would then say movers, meathead, movers. And then it'd be like salmon going upstream. We'd just be going through all the people and just handing out business cards. And then one of the guys was like a particularly good singer. If there was like a pretty girl, we'd like run around, we'd like circle around and serenade her and then give her a business card. And we were just like ruthless, ruthless marketers. Um, you know, another, another thing is whenever we had uh, uh, some extra money from, uh, from the living job, I had a connection where we had these magnets made and it had uh meathead movers and then our pager number believe it or not and uh, we asked our friends and our friends and our friends girlfriends and everyone to put these magnets on their cars you know because we couldn't afford any advertising and would go to my pager number uh since the phone book you know was uh was was out of commission and um and then, you know, another thing, like in the spirit of asking for forgiveness as, instead of permission is uh, we started, I went to the local newspaper and I said, look, the state of California turned off our uh, phone number 
uh, but it's all BS. And like, let me explain to you and, and explain why, like we're the good guys in the situation and we're going to become a legit mo- business. But in the meantime, we need to get from point A to point B. A lot of people are looking for us. Can we advertise in your newspaper? And, but we, but, because you can't advertise meathead movers because I we were shut down. We got to call ourselves meathead helpers and change our phone number. But here's the deal: like two, three weeks from now, you probably need a letter saying you can't advertise meathead helpers. So then we might have to have another conversation to change our name. And uh, after explaining it to the publisher, he looked at me, he gave me the nod, we shook hands, and we and uh, we probably changed. We just like meathead helpers to the meatheads to the to the moving labor meathead packers like you know everything we changed our name a couple different times over like the four or five month period it took for us to get our license and and it was like a game of cat and mouse how many times can our phone number be turned off but we got it done and we generated enough interest and demand from the community to look for us and support us because they knew we were trying to do things right and you just got to be scrappy and do things that other people aren't willing to do. And in my heart of hearts, I knew I wasn't going to go to jail. Like I, I had no assets. They couldn't take any money. <laughs> Are they seriously going to throw me in jail? Like I didn't have like, come on, you know, I'm just trying to make a buck, you know, and help out some other doing good work. You know, it's like Rocky um, said, sue me for what? Sue me for what? <laughs> sue me for what? Like, what are you going to do? Yeah, I don't have anything. Are you put me so, in jail? So, put me in jail. Base, put me in jail for doing a good job moving people. Facing obstacles and overcoming obstacles. I mean, that's yeah. that's what you did. And like, yeah. share some more of those obstacles that you've you've faced in in different situations, and how how guys that are listening could overcome the obstacles. Or, you know, there's so many guys that want to. You you talked about we made a lot of mistakes, we failed, and there's so many people that are afraid to make mistakes, afraid to fail. And I don't know why. It's just, it's real. It's, it doesn't sound like any of us have that, that problem because we've both, we've all failed a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, same. Uh, same. But how did, how did, how did that mindset work for you? How do you, how could you share that with the guys listening to this? You know, I, I think if there's something you want, you just got to attack it. You know, I mean, third period overtime like who wants it more so it's really a test of wills and um and how scrappy are you willing to get and you know we had a situation where one of our competing moving companies in our hometown was targeting our employees paying them under the table when we were uh when we were uh uh uh, totally above board uh paying them uh a couple dollars more an hour in cash marketing our employees like hey we're just like meathead movers but less expensive and not paying workers comp not paying taxes and charging our clients less and they had a nice brand they had a nice logo they had nice looking trucks and it was very hard to compete um and i called the owner i was like look uh you're not fighting fairly i'll fight fair all day long but you're not fighting fairly you're you're claiming to be a professional moving company you're not uh you're people don't know you're putting them at risk having unlicensed people in their home when they think that they're hiring licensed movers. It's one thing if someone's hiring a student labor service or like people off Craigslist or people off Home Depot, there's a certain amount of implied risk. But if you're going to have like your own professional moving trucks that claim to be professional, but lying and telling people under the table, um, that's not right. And I'm not going to be a bystander of losing market share to someone who's lying to the community. Well, directly targeting our business, our employees and our clients and having the same marketing messages. So um, I asked them politely to stop. Uh, I asked them uh, not so politely to stop. I had attorneys send them letters. That didn't work too. Um, Then, uh, so I was like, okay, how do I trap him? How do I trap this guy? And uh, uh, so then we, there was a survey that went out and we're like a census where uh, he had to disclose, all of us had to disclose how many employees and how many trucks that he had. Um, and he said that he had all these employees and all these trucks. So I then uh, went to the uh, workers comp state fund workers comp place and like literally waited in line and waited in the, in the lobby until someone would meet with me. And it took hours. 
And I was like, the, uh, this company is saying that they have all these people that are working for them. I'm just wondering if they're claiming that. And then uh, they went and answer. So then I went back and waited again and said, hey, I'm just wondering if this company who disclosed that they have all these employees, if they're paying their workers comp or not. And then they're, they're like, well, let me look. And then they, they're like, nope. I was like, okay, well, what do we do now? And then an investigation got started. Long story short, after me continuing to follow up with that investigator, after bringing this to their attention, uh, the owner of that company ended up uh, being charged with three different felonies and uh, got majorly slapped down. We then brought charges to him civilly, one, and uh, you know, and then the rest, the rest is history. Um, so I don't know how many other like business owners are willing to go to that level, but if someone is uh, uh, coming after you and fighting dirty, you know, you got to be just as scrappy, but do it in a way that you're proud of, you know, you got to fight hard, but you got to fight honorably. And, uh, and I, that was as hard and as honorable as I could have possibly fought. And when he uh, ended up uh, getting sentenced, at the courthouse, I was there. I made sure he knew that I was watching too. Oh yeah, man. Mad you know? respect. That's that's yeah. impressive, man. Great you know, story. Like, yeah. I mean, you got diligence and perseverance there that I think most people would be a combination of too scared and lazy to go through. Who would stand in line at the workman's comp office? And then when they say no, you follow up again and again and again. I mean, that's like you said, doing the things that other people won't do, getting up at four in the morning to run and lose weight or, or to, to do that stuff. And, you know, it, it kind of leads me to ask a question that kind of follows in the same vein of what Matt asked a moment ago, which is that, you know, you exhibit that diligence, that perseverance, that sort of warrior's mentality to, to not just fight and win, but to fight and win with honor and integrity with whatever it takes. And, you know, that might come normal to maybe people we're used to kind of circulating around, but it's really not that normal. Um, mm. You know, a lot of people don't, don't feel comfortable doing that. Right. And so, you know, especially when you were starting out, let's say, and you had to, you're passing out the business cards at the pager numbers and you're, doing the call and response of meathead and movers at the farmer's market, you know, to me, when I'm hearing that stuff, I'm hearing that, you know, that takes courage and bravery to, to not just, you talked about seeing it through at the end to the courthouse, but I'm thinking about, you know, it takes courage and bravery to actually start. Most people won't see it through, but most people won't start either because to them, they might feel scared. There's insecurities. Like they want to go sing in public to make a buck? Do they want to, you know, do that stuff? They want to be normal. They don't want to see, be seen as anything other than that. It would be weird. How did, how did you overcome what other people might have as those insecurities, those fears, that, that sense of, like, oh, I don't want to be weird. I don't want to be the weird guy or the weird company. How did, like, how did you completely ignore that or move past that? Or what would you tell someone who might be struggling with that to take that initiative to start some endeavor in their own life or whatever that is. You know, I mean, probably Rick, the same thing that uh, made you believe in yourself enough or fight hard enough to become an astronaut or coach Lindland to be a world-class athlete and coach. You have to find something that means enough to you that you're willing to endure enough pain in order to accomplish because it is that meaningful to you. You have to do things in your life that really, really friggin' matter. And in my life, I grew up in a broken home, uh, not feeling properly invested in or paid attention to. Um, and I absolutely had a chip on my shoulder and hated seeing how many of my friends had more than me, got more love than me, got more attention than me. Uh, I was absolutely committed and willing to do anything it took to get me and my brother out of that situation and to live a life with uh, more like respect and more love and 
more abundance of things that bring joy and pleasure, you know, because I was by far the, uh, had like, I, I, I had less than almost anyone I, I around me growing up and the drive to have a different life and to do that with my brother and to get positive affirmation from my clients. Um, it was free. It was deep. It was deep, you know, and I wasn't going to let, and, and, and I wasn't going to let anyone or anything get in the way of that. Wow. That's, that, that, and it's incredible. And it, and the joy part, I, I was just on a call this morning with uh, Gene Zanetti from the, the Mindset guys. Yeah. You seen those guys? Yeah, yeah, good, good dudes, good guys. Uh, he was giving me uh, questions, and and we were talking about, you know, the grind of wrestling. Everybody talks about, like, they wear it like a badge of honor. Like, mm-hmm. they grind anybody. It's like, why don't, and I, and I said, why don't we find joy and love? And I heard those words come out of you. And it's, it's the joy of serving a customer and they're grateful and they're happy. And it's the joy of providing opportunities for athletes and, and your employees to grow and get better and improve. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're not a moving company, you're a leadership development company in, in my opinion, you know, and, and I think that's what you're most proud of is that you're developing better people and you're using the moving company as that vehicle. And I just, you know, it's such an impressive story and it's exactly what this show is about. Uh, It's about developing leaders. It's called literally called leadership and character development. And what you're doing is you're instilling those characters, those character qualities into the, the student athlete workers and you're developing leaders. And it's just, it's a, it's such an impressive vehicle. I mean, who would have thought a moving company, but you're right. You, you just totally separated yourself from all the competition. You don't have competition because yeah. everybody else is a moving company. You're yeah. a leadership development company that happens to move people's furniture. <laughs> mm-hmm. Am, yeah. am I misstating? Am I misstating that? Aaron? No, or, sir. No, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's no, what that's I'm I, No. And that is ideally what we're trying to live up to all the time. And thank you for, thank you for seeing us and recognizing it because, um, so no, that, that's exactly who we are and what we're all about and who we strive and who we strive to be. And it's a, and, and, and that in itself is a, is a constant struggle and challenge too, especially as we get it's very bigger. inspiring. It's thank very you. inspiring. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's a lifestyle, it's a lifestyle company or you're, you're train you're you're providing a lifestyle to your employees and that translates to you're providing a certain element of a lifestyle to your to your clients then too of of how that procedure of the move works uh in a very different way so so like this is awesome i mean so what kind of feedback do you get have you heard from your customers i mean and clients i mean what's what's the back end of this what's their experience have what do what do you hear from the front lines when they see these guys who've gone through your, you know, whatever the number was, a 90 point, you know, training checklist and, and all that. What's the yeah. translation? It, it, it's normally positive, which is great. And that feels, and that feels good, but we learn the best from the negative feedback, of course, you know, we don't take negative feedback personal. Uh, it, I used to, um, but I, I don't anymore. It's just an opportunity to, you know, to improve. Um, so and and it's it's rewarding to uh to do a good job to take pride in what we do and when something goes wrong uh and when we mess up and when something gets damaged that's when we have the biggest opportunity to make a big impression on the client and we empower our frontline employees to discount a considerable amount off of the bill uh quickly so the client doesn't have to dwell on what went wrong. So they don't have to file a claim with us or anything like that. And we actually have a money back guarantee too. And we're the only company that does this where if any of our clients feel like they didn't get a good value out of any one of our movers or packers, they can tell us and we'll issue them a refund for what the value they feel they received. So for example, if we have a three-man job, Two guys are crushing it, working up to the meathead standard, 
And then one guy is checking his phone, not running when he's not carrying anything, uh, fumbling on assembling or disassembling uh, a desk or something. And if the client complains, <laughs> they uh, will say, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Compared to your other movers, what percentage of value do you feel you receive? Do you think you work 75%? 50% and whatever the client tells us, we'll issue them a refund. So that way it's kind of like going back to our roots, pay us only what you think we're worth, you know, and then the onus and accountability is on us. And then when we sit down with one of our employees without having to give them attitude or anything, we're like, Hey, the client wanted half the money back that we charged for you. What's going on? You know, and obviously we can't have too many more of these conversations, but that's the impression that you're leaving. What, what did you learn from this? And they're either going to be humble and look within and take some learning lessons or they're going to get defensive and how dare the customer and me, 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 me. And then that's when we know we either got to try to turn this employee's like mind around or, you know, or, or it's just not a good fit. Um, so yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, totally, man. That's, that's awesome. So you mentioned too, that, that you work out at the pit, at, which is a legendary training facility out there in San Luis Obispo with Hackleman, right? And so you got into Brazilian jiu-jitsu then. Is that yeah. is that right? Is that the, yeah. the mode you train there? Uh, yeah. So no longer at the pit. Uh, now I'm at a place called Paragon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know. I used to do a little bit of that out in Dallas too. That's right. Uh, they have one in Dallas. Yes. Yeah. Good. So what was the transition going to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? What's been your trajectory and experience in the sport and that? And then did you find yourself kind of going back and forth in terms of adopting some of the things that you were, you know, working on a business to mindsets or applications towards the Jiu Jitsu training and then vice versa, taking things that you were learning at the pit and then Paragon and taking that back towards the business world? Yeah. So, uh, my last MMA fight was in 2002. And then from there, I didn't train for about 16 years and I got fat. <laughs> and, and I just thought that as an adult, I'm just going to focus on working and I don't have enough time or energy to do both things. And then I had some life changes uh, and I decided to take my health seriously after a health scare. And then uh, uh, I decided I'm going to do jujitsu because a good friend of mine was doing it. And I figured, oh, it's probably just like wrestling. How hard can it be? And it's totally different, um, but absolutely fell in love with it. There's so many you know, crossovers in life and in wrestling uh, with, with jujitsu. It's a little bit of a slower pace. It's, I think it's a lot more technical. Um, I just turned 40 this year, so it's a lot like easier on the body, less impact. Uh, but great group of guys, <laughs> with that unique brotherhood, you know, that you just can't get anywhere else. Uh, uh, wrestling and jujitsu is very similar in that way because you know you're you're sweating and pushing and bleeding with those guys, and and uh, and the more you give, uh, the more you try to help other people improve their game, uh, the more you get. Uh, and, you know, so I, I love jujitsu. I think about jujitsu or do jujitsu every single day. I did this morning at 7.30 a.m., you know, for my meetings. And uh, right, uh, right after our call, Coach Matt, uh, I, I was in the driveway at my friend's house driving over to do jujitsu. <laughs> I saw you wearing your rash guard yeah, on, the yeah. way, on the call. Oh, yeah, exactly. So, um no, but it, it, it's awesome. And, and frankly, do you know what? I, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I wish someone would have grabbed me by my collar and said, when I, at, at 22, when I stopped competing, said, you don't have to stop here. You can keep training. You can keep coaching. You can keep wrestling. You can keep doing jujitsu. You can keep doing these things. Just because you want to take a career seriously doesn't mean you have to stop being an athlete. Being an athlete doesn't stop when you're done wrestling in college. You can do, you can stay competitive, keep that edge. Uh, and, and it's, and I really, really wish that uh, someone would have told me that because it's one of the few regrets I have in my life is, is, is stop training um, for, for those 16 years. But now that I have it, it's been great. Um, I got my blue belt like immediately 
uh, doing jujitsu. And then I competed in worlds, uh, five months after I, um, started training in jujitsu. Um, and I went one and one, uh, and lost a close match to the guy who ended up taking third in my division. Um, and I was supposed to wrestle in the U S open by blew out my knees, supposed to wrestle in Pan Ams, but then COVID hit. Um, so, uh, you know, so I, I, I just love it. I love the discipline. I love, uh, the people and I love having a big journey because there's like so many moves. There's so much to learn and there's so much I don't know. And to be totally honest, my technique of jujitsu sucks. <laughs> so I have so much to learn about it. Man. I'm, I'm like so novice at it still. Tell me about it. It's it's always about that growing and getting improving. And I mean that's me and kayak and I and I still do jujitsu and I and I still get on the mats and wrestle with with the guys as long as they're not too big like Adam Kuhn or some somebody like Colton Schultz. I don't I don't like wrestling with those guys anymore. But uh, <laughs> But, you know, it's been a great call. Before we leave, though, I, I just want to finish up with one more thing. Um, I don't want to take up all of your time, but how did you start helping with the domestic violence and giving to that cause? You do a lot of philanthropic events. You require your, your – I'm, I'm going to call them athletes – your athlete employees to yeah. uh, give back to the community, but uh, specifically domestic violence and why that's so important to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so when we first started the company, uh, I'd get calls periodically from women who are looking to be, leave their abusive relationship, and they'd and you know part of, of abuse is controlling the pocketbook. So what these women would tell me uh, was, I don't have any money, but I'll, okay, I have a TV or I have a couch. Will you please just help me? And I think they contact us because they assumed we were cheap. And um, I was like, yeah, we'll help you. No problem. Like, and I'm not going to charge you. I believe what you're telling me. I can hear the trembling in your voice. And we would just go in and help them and we would do it for free. And then a couple months later, got a, a very similar phone call. Another woman in a bad situation looking to flee, flee their abusive relationship. Boom, help them out. A few months later, same phone call. Long story short, after. Um, like two or three years of this uh, one time we were on a move and then the guy came home and it got contentious and he accused us of stealing his things, you know, a toaster oven got thrown and the police got called. And uh, luckily it didn't, uh, uh, it, it, it didn't, it didn't get worse than that. You know, it, it, it remained, um, uh, it, it, it didn't uh, escalate any further than that. But that got me because I wasn't always on these moves. I was on that one. But uh, that got me thinking like, hey, if we keep doing these moves, clearly, clearly people need to move for domestic violence consistently. And if we keep doing it, eventually something really bad is going to happen. So, uh, one, I want to keep doing these moves. And two, if I'm going to keep doing these moves, I owe it to my employees uh, to put them in a safe situation. So I then knocked on the door at the local women's shelter and said, look, we're doing these moves. It got, it got, uh, uh, pretty, uh, hairy. Uh, we want to continue to do these moves, but we want to do it in a safe way. How, what can we do? And then, uh, we worked out an agreement where we basically ride the coattails of all the domestic, all the safety protocols of the local domestic violence shelter, where they make sure it's a legitimate situation. Uh, they can offer a array of other services to help along with moving. And then when, and then when it comes time to move after they go through their process, they contact us and we, and we do the move for free. But instead of the victim of domestic violence, being our customer directly, it's the local domestic violence shelter. So then we started doing that and it became a thing, you know, it became, uh, and I'm convinced like it's the, most meaningful and valuable way a moving company can give back is to help someone possibly flee an abusive relationship and possibly help save another person's life. And it became a really meaningful thing to us and a really cool thing to teach the young men and women that we have working here, um, you know, how to be on the right side of the issue. And uh, for every time we open up an office, that's the gift we give to each community uh, is we 
we partner up with a local shelter and we offer unlimited free moving services to anyone fleeing an abusive relationship. Oh, that's great, great story. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so, I mean, I mean, so I had to flee a few of those things when I was a kid with my mom and I just have immense respect for, for your efforts on that. If, yeah. if people want to, you know, if, if we want to donate something like that, is there a way that we can support that? You know, really, uh, every single person, if, if you think about what you offer, you know, I mean, number one, I think anyone go to their local shelter and offer money. And then two, think about the service offerings that you or your business has. And how can you help out someone who's fleeing an abusive relationship, who's in transitional living or in a process of rebuilding their life? Even if it's like offering a job and maybe you like give the, give them a ride or pay them a little bit more, or if you work in a restaurant, offer some food, you know, if you're a handyman, maybe you can offer some free handyman services to one of the shelters, you know, whether you're offsetting the cost of uh, the shelter or you're adding a service that can be of value to someone who's fleeing or in an abusive relationship. Um, and working with the shelter to do it so it's in a cohesive organized manner uh uh with a with a conversation and some creativity other people anyone i think can find a really cool and unique way to give back so but it, it, it but but it, it but i think it takes like going to the shelter and tell them who you are what you have access to what you do for a living and having a conversation like how can i help that, that's it Wow. That's amazing. Um, that's inspiring. Like I, I, I learned so much just from listening to you on this call. I, like I, I want to, yeah, be able to provide the same stuff that you do to the employees, to the community. That's just inspiring. It's, it's amazing. It's exactly what, you know, it's, it's all about, it's all about service and uh, it's been an inspiring story. Thank you so much for sharing it with our audience. I, I know our athletes are going to learn so much from this. Um, Thank you. I have one one question more. Go for it, Rick. Now, Aaron, you said we could ask you anything. <laughs> anything. I didn't say I'd answer it. I didn't say I'd answer uh, it. But you can, <laughs> you can ask it. I, I got to ask because there's a famous story running around for probably a decade or two now on the internet. And um, not about you personally, but I, I've heard some rumblings about it. And there's an old story that uh, back in the San Luis Obispo days of maybe the early 2000s or late 90s, there was supposed to have been an epic brawl that may or may not have involved some people from the pit. Um, that may or may not have involved uh, some epic confrontation with a, a rowdy group of SEALs. And I, I, I want to know if you have, might have heard any, any rumblings or stories about that in the neighborhood. Oh man, putting me on the spot. <laughs> so yeah, this was, uh, so this, this was, this was pretty wild. This was pretty wild. Uh, slow kickboxing in the pit. And a lot of the guys were working downtown and, and, and at downtown and uh, a gnarly, gnarly fight broke out. And my involvement was I was driving downtown in the middle of the street and I see my friends fighting and actually having like an, an honest fight, like an honest challenge. And these are all professional fighters, like names that I, I probably shouldn't share, but like recognize some of them were recognizable names and the training partners of those recognizable names in this on high Guerra street in San Luis Obispo. And, uh, you know, probably 20, 30 people. And it was, in taking over the entire street and i i couldn't even believe my eyes while i was seeing it. i parked the car in the middle of the street tried to be helpful where where i could <laughs> and it it ended up at just kind of like a standoff once the cops got there and then there was an organized meeting at another place and it uh and that ended up getting called off by one of the guys who ran the gym um but it was 
two groups that were not going to back down. And I think the fight was about like over 10 minutes and it, 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 and both sides expected to win. Both sides were not used to losing and I've never, and I, I've never, I've never seen anything like it. And those, uh, those Navy stills are tough, tough dudes. And, uh, and, 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 and scrappy is all, and scrappy is all hell. Um, but they were fighting guys who, my understanding, this is kind of just at the creeping edge of when UFC was simmering to prominent. So a lot of the names of the people that became really well known at the time, yeah, they were under the radar. So as far as the SEALs are understand, these were just some bums in a bar, just some townies or something. And yeah, so there was like a, a sort of a misidentification that, that seemed to happen. And then, like you said, two groups that probably, you know, uh, shouldn't be, <laughs> shouldn't be going at each other. It sounds pretty epic. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, yeah, it, it was, it, it was, it was wild. And I've heard the story. I've heard the story brought up over the years, like numerous times from people like in the armed forces circle. And then of course, you know, uh, the slow kickboxing pit and, uh, and, and, and the pit crew, but yeah, that was, um, yeah, I've, I've never, I've, I've never seen, I, I've never seen anything like that. It was basically the pit fight team versus, uh, a pack of the Navy SEALs and, um, and, and no one was going down. <laughs> yeah. Legendary, <laughs> legendary stuff. It doesn't happen. Those things don't happen anymore. But, no, no, no. I mean, and we're going to have to get you back out to Colorado and run some more white water. Hey, that'd be awesome, coach. That'd be awesome. Let, let me know next guys. time you're in Denver. I All will. Right, brother. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Take care. Of it. All right. Bye-bye.